Hi guys, welcome back. This week we are returning to the modern era and we are going to be working on something that of course is extremely popular and frequently requested, which is even more World War II German camouflage. You guys can't seem to get enough of this and luckily there are a lot of different patterns that I haven't covered yet so we can still do quite a bit. This week we are going to be working on this guy here. He is from North Star. Uh, they have quite a comprehensive range of especially World War II Germans, and I like their sculpture, sculpting style because it's a bit chunky, a little big, uh, maybe a little crude in some ways, but I really like that type of figure. I find it the most pleasant to paint, so that's why I'm using them in this case. And this guy that I showed you here, he is sort of, I don't know, sort of late war-ish German. He's got a, he's got a camo smock on and pants, and he's very versatile. You can paint him as SS, you can paint him as Wehrmacht, there's a lot of choices actually in how to paint this, and then of course you have a lot of options in uh, camouflage as well, which is why I like this particular range of figures, because you've got, they've got quite versatile units. So that's what we're going to be doing, and the pattern that we're going to be focusing on today is the oak leaf pattern. It is not exactly, sort of a precursor, not exactly, to the pea pattern that we took a look at earlier, and if you want to see that, look at my channel. I do have a tutorial on the pea pattern already. This one <clears throat> shares some things in common with the pea pattern, but it's maybe a little bit more regular. Um, I actually like it better because I feel like it, it just, doesn't, just doesn't feel quite so random. It, it's more, there's more larger areas of color on it, but it is sort of based on lots and lots and lots of little dots in the same way that the pea pattern is. As usual, I'll be using Dennis Peterson's uh, book on SS camouflage for a reference here. Um, it's a great resource. As I've mentioned in earlier videos here, you can kind of see, and here we've got quite an extensive section on the oak leaf pattern, which came in two color variants. There was sort of a green version and then a brown version, so the winter version, the summer version, basically. That is actually true in nearly all German camouflage patterns. They made them into at least two variants. I am going to be painting the brown version for you today. I rather like that, but if you guys uh, are really, really interested, I may go back and do the green one later, though it's not too different. It's just a matter of switching up your color choices a little bit. So, But I know people like to know what colors to use, so I may be returning to that. Now the figure, he's all ready to go. I, as usual, have base coated him and painted his skin. This tutorial is going to be another one that uses toothpicks, so make sure you have some of those ready. Um, I've had some questions about, you know, why toothpicks? Are they really better than brushes? They're not really better than brushes. You can make really good, really small circles with brushes too, dots, but it's just a lot more work. If you've ever tried to make a little circle with a brush, you know it's kind of a pain in the butt. You can do it, but you have to be very careful and take a lot of time or it doesn't look round and it just messy. So you can probably actually get nicer dots ultimately with a brush, but you'll spend a lot more time doing it. It's going to be a lot more fussy. So that's why I use the toothpick. It's mostly about being practical and the fact that these patterns have lots and lots of dots on them. If you, you know, had to carefully form all those dots with a brush, it would really take a long time. So this is really just a way to speed the process up, make it more practical, you know. And, and so it's not, no, toothpicks don't make the very best dots in these patterns, but they do it and they balance the, a, a good look with being, you know, achievable. So that's why I tend to use them instead of working with the brushes. But you can use a brush if you want to do it that way. And as a matter of fact, if you are going to, I recommend you get a very, very large brush because ideally I think you'd want to just be able to dip the tip in paint and then touch it to the uniform and get a dot exactly the right size that way. But in order to do that, you would need a brush with a very, a very large brush because it would need to have a very big tip indeed, probably to form the right size dot just right off the bat. So you'd have to go pretty large. Um, and I normally don't myself have any brushes quite that large, but you might be able to do it that way as well. So that's another that's another option, but I would say, you know, toothpicks are easy, everybody has them, there's really no reason not to do it. So that's what I'm going to do, and we're going to just go ahead and get started. I'm going to, you know, just show you how you can do this. As I said, this pattern is a little bit more regular than P pattern, but it has a lot in common, and there's some other sort of things that you need to know, some characteristics of this pattern that are important to make sure that you get a good result 
in what are you know in whatever piece of clothing that you're working on. So as always, we're going to start out by working on the camouflage section of the uniform. And in this case, I've decided already that we're going to be focusing here on the smock. Now, this guy is equipped in such a way that you could also really kind of choose to paint his pants in the pattern, probably. But for some reason, oak leaf seems to appear mainly on camo smocks. So we're just going to be doing the smock in this case, because I also want some contrast. So the first step here is to be applying a nice thick base coat. And then we're going to be using Vallejo for pretty much all the camo, because they have just the right colors for it. So this color here is a Vallejo German Camouflage Medium Brown. And it's the perfect base for this and many of the SS camo patterns. After the base coat is dry, you can go right ahead and apply a really nice heavy wash of Agrax or a shade. This is just sort of preliminary shading. It's going to save us a little time later on. And then with the preliminary shading done, I'm also going to do a little bit of preliminary highlighting. Uh, since this is really going to be all covered up with camouflage pretty soon, you don't have to worry about getting too fancy here, or putting on a lot of different layers. But I find that at least one sort of highlight layer here is helpful and it just gives you more depth and range of color. Um, in order to make my highlight shade here, I have taken the German Camouflage Medium Brown and I have mixed a little Boneyard Light from Foundry into it. But it could, doesn't have to be Boneyard Light. It could really be any other sort of whitish cream color. I'm sure Vallejo makes one too. I don't have it, but really any sort of warm cream color would be perfect for lightening it up. So I've just lightened that base color up a little bit and I'm applying it kind of thinly and blending it out and, you know, defining the, the higher areas of color and, and kind of just picking those out and only leaving sort of the recesses and the folds and that really nice dark brown that I got from applying the wash earlier on. And now it's going to be time to start applying the pattern. Um, there, are, aside from the base color, the um, Oak leaf pattern has three browns in it. It has a very deep brown, which you can see I'm applying here, a very reddish brown, high uh, color, and then there's also another brown that's very subtly lighter, or actually it's subtly darker than the base color, but it's so subtle that even on a normal full-size version of this uniform, it's very hard to see the difference. It's very low contrast. So I'm actually going to be completely omitting that from the pattern because at this scale it's really not going to show up and there's just no point to it. It'll just, you just risk kind of muddying the pattern. So what I'm doing here is applying areas first of the dark color, which is German camouflage black brown by Vallejo. I'm applying dots and you want to apply those mostly in sort of large masses as you can see here. So I'm applying sort of big groups. You want quite a few really big groups because that's really a characteristic of this pattern. And you can put a few smaller, less, you know, well-defined areas too, or just a few loose dots off by themselves because you want some areas that are really dense and then maybe a few areas that are, have more of the base coat showing through. But it needs to be a little random. Of course, you can mix this up quite a bit per figure. So now we're going to move on to the sort of bright orange brown color, which is really the most noticeable part of this camo pattern. And I am using Vallejo orange brown for this, but that color I find at this scale at least gets a little bit too dark. So I've taken my boneyard light or whatever cream color you're using, it doesn't matter, and lightened it up ever so slightly here. And you can see now that I'm going to apply it. And the way this works basically is with the oak leaf pattern, you have sort of that dark brown as a base, and then you have the orange, um, and you're also sort of lots of little dots, but it tends to almost always be on top of the dark brown areas. And the dark brown should actually serve almost always as sort of a border. So where you've got the orange circles, you're almost always going to see little brown borders sort of outlining the orange. Or very, very often you're going to see that. Even in the center of a very concentrated mass, you can have quite a lot of concentrated orange circles that all kind of run together into a blob. But within that, you should still be seeing some brown outlines kind of coming in between there. 
And that's what I'm aiming to do here. Also, you can put some orange blobs kind of off by themselves because, of course, as I said, there was that sort of other uh, very sort of medium brown color that's very, very subtly different from the base and we're going to omit from the pattern. And you would see that sometimes also uh, used to border the um, orange brown in the same way that the dark does in many places. So if you put just the orange off by itself as a spot, it, you can you can sort of get away with it like that, basically. So, you know, you're just going to want to go back over, like you can see I'm doing, and apply the orange dots and make sure you get good coverage here. That's one thing about the oak leaf pattern. It's pretty, there's pretty heavy coverage. You, you're not going to want very big open areas of the field color. So you can see I even go back later and add some more large uh, masses of color because that's so characteristic of the pattern. And I felt like there wasn't quite enough density of those big areas because at this scale, it, particularly, it's really important to emphasize those. Once you've filled in the orange brown, you can then go back in with your camouflage uh, black brown and you can add some dark circles on top of your orange brown concentrations of color because you'll see that too in the pattern that you would get some of the dark brown circles would be appearing over top or overlapping the orange brown. Um, you won't see very often the black brown just appearing by itself in the field with nothing on top of it. It does happen, but it's, it's not very common in the pattern. But you definitely will see dots over top of the orange area. So you can see that's what I'm trying to simulate here. And sometimes, and, but still, even then, that doesn't happen very often in, you know, the probability of that doesn't seem to be still super high in the pattern. So after I do that, I'm going to keep going back and fiddling with it a little bit and then continue layering orange brown dots over areas where I thought I got too much dark brown in because you want to, the orange brown probably, you want that to feel quite dominant. Um, the dark black brown can really overwhelm everything if you're not careful but you want that orange brown to really stand out and you want to try to get as many instances where it looks like those orange dots have dark brown outlines around them because that is something that's very characteristic of the pattern and you know you, in order to get that to really look good you may need to apply several layers here and if your toothpick gets too smashed or dull don't hesitate to replace it because the point can get a little flat and then it doesn't work well so you may need to change toothpicks at some point. And also you probably don't want your paint to get too thick. If it gets too thick, it won't go on very well. You'll have a harder time. So you don't want it too thin because then you risk it running and making a mess and you really don't want that. <laughs> but at the same time, if it's too thick, it won't transfer very well. So you need to keep a nice medium consistency here at all times. Here you can see I'm going back in and adding another large orange area because I didn't feel like I had enough. So, and I'm going to be adding in some brown and then going back over it until I get, you know, a sufficient, you know, outline situation that makes me happy with the pattern. Once you're satisfied with how your dots uh, look and you've got a good distribution, then you need to think about uh, getting some more variation in the overall color of the jacket. And, and and once again, because this is a complex pattern, we're going to be relying on washes to shade the pattern rather than attempting to apply highlight colors. So I'm going to start out here with an Agrex Earthshade wash. And you can see that I'm going to be applying it in all the areas where there's recesses or folds or anything, or just any area that I want to feel slightly darker. And you're going to want to go back over this a couple times, obviously, especially in areas where you want to feel extra dark. So you can kind of work your way around the figure. And by the time you're done, uh, the start will be dry enough that you can kind of start working your way around again. So you'll probably want to make several uh, circuits of the figure until, in, in order to get, you know, enough dark contrast going and enough variation. And, you know, just make sure you leave areas where you really expect light to be hitting without any wash, so the tops of sleeves and the back and stuff, because you want there really to feel like there's contrast. 
Once I finished with Agrax Earthshade Wash, I decided that I wanted to get even more contrast. So then I went back in with a Nuln Oil Wash and I applied that again to the mop much more sparingly. So I didn't take it as far and I really only used it sort of down in creases or where there were edges to the jacket or sort of around the edges of his uh, strapping and belt, those kinds of things. But that was sort of an even stronger emphasis, I thought. And because this is a very dark brown pattern, uh, the, the Nuln oil is not, it doesn't really mess it up. You just, but you do need to be more careful with it. So, you know, don't, you don't, don't be so generous as you were with the Agrax Earthshade, but you definitely probably need this as well in order to really really emphasize you know differences in tone and to really get enough contrast in your in your jacket i'm not pretty satisfied with the jacket it still looks a little bit messy but that's going to really get fixed once we start painting all the equipment and stuff that's sort of overlapping it'll make a huge difference so i'm going to now move on to the pants I am going to use a base coat here of German Field Grey World War II. There's also a German uniform. I do not like it as well. It is much greener and I think it is not, at least for later war uniforms, as accurate. So I like to use this grey-green color. So just go ahead and apply a nice even base coat to your pants. Once that's done and dry, you're going to want to put a wash on and that's really just to darken the base and it'll save us having to add as many different highlight colors and for that I'm taking Nuln Oil and mixing in some, Car some Karelia Green Shade to that and applying a pretty heavy wash to the entire, you know, pair of trousers. And once the wash is dry, you can start highlighting the trousers. I'm going to first highlight them just with the German field gray again, nothing extra added in because that shade color that I applied as a wash was so um, strong that you can just go right ahead and highlight it with the original base color and it will make a difference. So I'm going to be putting that pretty much everywhere, just leaving the nice dark color down in the creases and folds of his pants. Once that is applied, then we can start highlighting. And like I said, I like to keep this process as simple as possible, especially when we're working with Vallejo colors, because I don't want to have to have lots and lots of different kinds of paints I have to deal with and then have to explain to you. I want to use the minimum number, but I also want to keep my mixing process simple. So in order to make a highlight for this, I'm just going to take my uh, Boneyard Light again, or whatever cream color you're using, anything will do, and I'm going to apply it a little better, actually apply, add a little bit of that into my field gray to lighten it up. And that is going to be my primary highlight on these pants. I also thin it down quite a bit because I don't want it to get too light and I want to be able to apply it fairly transparently. So you can see I'm adding it to areas where light is hitting, like knees and the bottom of the cuffs and stuff, and then blending it out quite a bit. Actually, I might have gone with a slightly darker color here because it probably would have saved me on a little bit of blending, but that's up to you. You can make it really work for you either way. I'm also going to take this opportunity to paint his spats or putties or whatever you want to call them. Now, I study quite a few pictures of these guys and there seems to be very little difference in color between the putties and the pants. There was a slight difference, but it was quite, quite subtle. It was, it, it seems to me from the pictures that these were about the color of the pants, but ever so slightly lighter. So in order to paint them, I'm just gonna base coat them first with the German Field Gray World War II. I'm not gonna apply a wash to darken them because I want them to feel lighter. And then I'm gonna go ahead with that highlight color I already made for the pants and apply that pretty generously to them. So after you finish that, they're gonna look kind of the same color as the pants um, and then in order to differentiate them further I'm then going to mix even more of the, my cream color my boneyard light whatever into that to get an even lighter color and you can see I'm going to apply that to those putties especially pretty heavily I'm going to layer it on and blend it out too so there's still a little darker color but by doing that you're going to see that it's the same color basically as the pants but distinctly lighter for the most part and that I think kind of accomplishes that goal of having more or less the same color, but then slightly, maybe slightly different tonally 
than the pans. And I will use just a little bit of this light color on the pans, but then only very sparingly, like a small amount on the knees and some of the very sharp creases. But don't put too much on the pans you, because you don't want them to look like they're the same color as the putties. They need to be a little bit darker. So, you know, just really only use that on the pants as an edge highlight. If you have a model that has seams too on the pants, sculpted seams, you could also use it to edge the seams, things like that. With the pants done, I'm going to move on to painting the black leather areas on this model, which include his boots, his belt, and um, equipment straps, and also sort of the top of his canteen, which was kind of a painted black metal. So to base coat these, just use black. As simple as that, this is from Vallejo, but it doesn't really matter. Once you've got a good base coat down, you can start highlighting. My first highlight is going to be German gray. Now you could just take and mix some white in your black and lighten it slightly. That's one way to do it. I'm using German gray here because German gray has a slightly different, it has a slight bluish cast. And I like that there's a little something in the in my black besides just you know white that it's it's it's, it's a, just adds a little interest so that's why that's going to be my first highlight and you can apply the german gray pretty generously to all your areas you know except the darkest creases and then i'm going to just proceed and highlighting all the black areas by mixing a little bit in this case silver gray from vallejo into that German gray and I'm going to do that I think twice so my first layer will have a small amount of the silver gray and I'll be applying that sort of as a highlight to and blending it out on the straps and boots and also in the water bottle and then I'll add even more silver gray and so that I have a fairly light color and that's really going to serve kind of as an edge highlight and for picking out details and Previously, I've done black leather and I've spent too much time trying to make it really shiny and high contrast. I'm not doing that here. So don't try to get really bright, light, shiny, you know, gray effects and then spend a lot of time blending them out. You know, just make, uh, keep your, your, the differences between your grays reasonably subtle and you'll have a lot easier time. It's probably more believable looking anyway because this stuff is going to get worn and tarnished real quick out in the field anyway and you're not really going to have a lot of shiny leather. It'll and it's just it's just generally a lot easier. So just go ahead and apply those sort of gray highlights to your you know black belt and boots and it actually shouldn't be too difficult or take you too much time. If you want, you can also put a little bit of brown into your final highlight on the leather areas, particularly because if it's leather, there's probably going to be a slight brownish cast to it, even though it's black leather, especially where it's worn, like on the toes and heels of the boots. So I've taken some of my German um, camouflage medium brown that I already had out anyway and just mixed it into my lightest br um, gray highlight and reapplied it to some of those areas just to give it a nice little cast. It adds a nice little detail and it makes it feel uh, more like, you know, it, like it's something that's been out in the field, that's seen some wear, and it keeps it from just being too starkly black and white looking. Now our soldier's helmet is pretty well covered in, in sort of webbing and leaves, so you don't get to see too much of the helmet, but I do want to base coat the whole thing for those areas that stick through. And to do this, I'm going to be using German gray, and I'm going to mix a little bit of my German field gray World War II in there just to get a little bit of a greenish cast to my gray because this the, the helmet it, it does have I feel a slight greenish tint to it so if you do that you'll you know you'll get that effect better and now for the equipment bag and water bottle cover um, these actually came in different flavors there were different color variants on both of these pieces of equipment but because I already have a pretty brown sort of palette that I'm working with here I'm going to go with the brown variants on both of these so the color I'm using here is my base coat is going to be khaki gray also from Vallejo and you can just go ahead and you know apply uh, even base coat to those areas And then once that's dry, you're gonna to wanna to apply a nice, strong Agrax Earth Shade wash all over there. And then you can highlight the equipment bags. I'm first gonna just go back over everything with the khaki gray a little bit. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and make highlight colors like I've been doing throughout the whole video by mixing my boneyard light into it. So I'm going to start out by mixing in first, not too much, and I'm going to apply that uh, along the edges and the top surfaces, wherever light is hitting, to lighten and brighten the, um, the canvas here on both the bag and on the water bottle. And, and then and that's pretty much all you need to do though. I also am going to make one further edge highlight just by adding even more boneyard in and I'll get quite a light color that way. And that I'm going to mainly be applying sort of to the edges of that bag flap and really just a very few very select areas where I really want to emphasize that there's a lot of light and really emphasize contrast. You probably don't, for example, even need to do this on the water bottle cover, but it is a nice detail for the mess bag. Now let's work on the wood and leather areas, and as I've been doing the last several tutorials, I'm going to combine those two things because there's a lot of similar colors involved. The leather areas we need to worry about here are going to be the strap on the front of his canteen, um, the strap holding his helmet on, and also the, at the back of his equipment belt, his suspenders, usually that area sort of where it crosses, there's a sort of a leather reinforcement there, and that's often a brown leather instead of the black leather that you've got on the rest. So I'm base coating all these leather areas using German camouflage black brown, as I generally do. I'm then going to base coat the stock of his uh, rifle as well, and I am using a bay brown shade for that purpose. And now I'm just going to highlight the leather areas really quickly starting out with the bay brown medium color. You can put this pretty much everywhere and be pretty generous. Just make sure some of your nice black brown base shows through here and there. And then we'll move on to the chestnut brown shade color from Foundry and as you know I will apply that very sparingly kind of as a blended edge highlight to all my leather areas but which are all very very small here so you don't have to do very much but then quite generously as you can see onto the stock of his gun and I just apply it starting from the edge areas and then blending outwards and so making sure it's strongest sort of at the edges of the wood and then gets a little bit lighter going outward but still much much more powerful color than what I was getting on the leather. Then I'll finally take the chestnut medium color and I will I am going to use that on the leather areas but very very small amount just the tiniest indication along the edges just to bring it out a little bit be very careful with that you don't want to overdo it and on the gun I'm definitely going to be much more forceful with it it's going to go a lot on the edge of the stock once again and blending out and then on the other parts of the gun along the barrel where there's sort of edges to the wood I'm going to apply it as a very clear edge highlight there and quite strongly too but you don't really have to blend it too much there just what you want to make sure of is that you you the, the amount on the gun is noticeably more than on the leather so that you you, you know that you have a, a decidedly different look between those two areas. Now you're going to want to finish up the helmet. I'm first going to do a little highlighting on the metal areas that you can see, especially where the edge of the helmet metal is visible, and I'm just going to use the German Field Gray for this, and I'm just going to sort of apply it very lightly as a highlight color, just in a few places, so, you know, just to get a little more variation in the tone. And then I'm going to move on to painting sort of the webbing that's covering his hat. And I'm just going to do this using the Foundry Rawhide Triad. So really straightforward, just carefully apply, especially the base color in the Rawhide Triad to all the areas where you've got these cords. And then highlight it using the medium tone. And then with the high highlight tone, highlight again. Actually with the high highlight tone, I tried to make it look a little bit like rope. So I kind of made little tiny sort of dots or sort of stuttered pattern along the uh, along the rope surface. That made it a little, yeah, it looked more like there was some texture there. And you know, it, it sort of made it differentiated those three colors a little bit further. It just, it just generally keeps the whole thing a little bit more interesting looking. Then I painted the leaves, which is always something I really enjoy because I feel like it brings the whole hat together. Until you do this, the whole thing can look a little messy and 
it's just hard to see where one thing ends and the other begins and it, it just yeah it's sloppy so I'm using here the force green triad from foundry but you could really use any kind of nice bright living kind of green shade for this that you want it's not very critical so that's also nice because you don't have to worry about precise color matching so I, as you see I'm just gonna put the base color the shade color on and then I'm gonna highlight with the medium color kind of particularly sort of along one half of each leaf so it looks like there's sort of a darker side and a lighter side to each leaf and then I'm going to use the forest green light sort of to pick out some veins and sort of tips on the leaves that kind of thing you can really have fun here it's it's not you don't have to be too precise and it's really nice because it'll help you kind of cover up and neaten any sort of you know imprecision you had in painting those 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 ropes earlier that were on the helmet and uh this particularly on this figure this the sculpting on the helmet is a little bit sloppy so this is really your opportunity to sort of clean that up and get you know a nice finished looking result and finally we need to paint the metal areas of course and actually in this figure it's not all that much it's mostly going to be on the gun um but also you want to make sure you paint the sort of the buckle at the back of his suspenders and of course also the buckle on his water canteen. Uh, the base color I'm using for the metal as usual is German Grey from Vallejo with a little bit of uh, Vallejo Air gun metal mixed in just to make it slightly more metallic and I'm just going to base coat everything with that. I'm then going to apply a highlight by mixing in slightly more of the gun metal into my base color and I'm gonna pretty much highlight everything with that carefully and then finally I'll take just pure gun metal at, and on the gun particularly that should be the highest highlight and you should only apply it to areas where there would be a lot of wear and where he'd be handling it a lot like the bold action and maybe the tops of some of the bands and stuff but be very sparing on the gun because we don't want it to be too light um, on the other areas, you can be much heavier with this highlight. You can make them a bit shinier. In fact, I then went back in with a little bit of Vallejo Air Steel, and I highlighted the buckles on his straps a little bit more just to emphasize them, because otherwise you can, you can even hardly see that they're metal at all. On his canteen, the top part, there's like a little detachable drinking cup. You can choose to add some metallic sort of scratches and dings to this if you want. I often do because they were painted metal but they tended to get dinged up so it's a nice little extra detail to make the figure more interesting. And here is our finished World War II SS soldier wearing an oak leaf pattern camouflage smock. I hope you found this useful. I think this pattern is fairly achievable. It's probably easier to do than the P pattern that I covered some videos ago. You should check that out for more of this sort of dot style camo. This one is easier because there's less colors you have to worry about, less variation, and as soon as you remove extra colors and variation from a pattern, it gets easier because, you know, the more colors you have in there, the higher the risk of you getting a messy, kind of muddy result and losing clarity at this particular scale. And that's why, as I said before, I removed that extra medium brown color that's in the real pattern because at this scale, I don't think it adds anything. You can hardly see it and it just makes this harder to pull off. The, it's, it's always, you know, as we've said a hundred times about reducing the pattern to its most important elements and really only, you know, replicating the things that give you, you know, the correct impression of the pattern to sort of its essence. And you don't have to put in every single detail to give sort of a good effect that is reminiscent of that, that particular uniform. And I think the rest of this figure is quite simple. We've covered painting these greens and browns and equipment before, but I hope that maybe I had a few new ideas for how you could approach these colors. So if you like this video, as usual, like it, um, favorite it, share it with your friends. That's always appreciated. And you can always subscribe too if you want to keep up on my latest videos. I haven't decided what I'm going to do next week. I might continue with some more modern soldiers because I have quite a few to work with, but I might j jump back in time a little bit now and do something a little bit different just for my own amusement and for those of you who, you know, need to, who want to see something a little bit different and aren't like quite such big modern fans. So until then, happy painting.